Um, my name is Ehi Lee and I'll be in the interviewer and today is the 29th of October of 2015. We're located in the Julian Samora Library at the campus of the University of Notre Dame at South Bend, Indiana. Um, I'll be interviewing Rosa Ricala, author of Poetry Collections and Documentaries and The Last of Sen Unsentimental Waters, and two chapbooks, Some Martin uh, Disasters This Century and Undocumentary. She has also translated poetry by Cecilia Vicuña, Lourdes Vasquez, and Lila Zemborain, among others. I would, like you to, I would like to thank you for being part of this uh, oral history project with us at the Institute of Latino Studies in the University of Notre Dame. No, thank you for asking. Um, for the purposes of documentation, uh, could you please tell us your full name, date, and place of birth, and where you're living today? Rosa Arcala, uh, date of birth is January 7th, 1969. I was born in Patterson, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and I currently live in El Paso, Texas. Thank you. And to start, I would like you. I would want. I like. <laughs> I would like to ask you uh, to tell us about your childhood and your family in general. Um, like I said, I grew up in Patterson, New Jersey, and that's where I lived for my entire childhood and my early adulthood. So I moved. I moved from Patterson, New Jersey, to Jersey City when I was, I think, about 22. Mm -hmm. Um, my childhood, I, I grew up in the Riverside section of Patterson, New Jersey, um, on the border of an industrial section where there were factories. Um, so it was sort of the, the last house on the corner before the factories began. And they used to be um, uh, old silk mills, but they, the factories were of various things that uh, by that by the time that I lived there, um, in the uh, 70s and 80s, and they became plastics factories. There was a, a paint factory, Caddy Corner, to my house. And in fact, blew up when I was in high school. There was cool. a huge explosion there, which I've written about. Um, and you know, it was a uh, it was a working class neighborhood. Um, you know, a lot of the families worked in factories or in uh, various kind of working class jobs, at least what were, you know, working class jobs at that time, a lot of those factories have closed down. Um, and, you know, I went to public school. I have two older brothers. Um, my parents um, spoke Spanish. They never spoke English. Um, they never really learned it. My dad worked at a dye house, which was not far from where we lived. And my mother worked a variety of, of assembly line jobs, usually within the same neighborhood. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that, that about sums it up, I think. I don't know. No, oh, yes. Thank you. Sure. Um, and this is another general question. Um, how did you come to be a writer? Um, you know, I mean, I remember very, very early on, uh, I was thinking about this because my, my daughter is six years old and she's in first grade and she likes to um, create book covers and she's writing her first stories. And, you know, I want to say it's because her parents are writers and she hears this talk all the time and we're always talking about book covers and we have our friends' books and all this stuff. Um, but the truth is, is at her age, I was already making my little books. And I, I remember very clearly a first grade teacher showing another teacher a book I had made. And that was that first moment of, oh, peop like, people will talk about something I've made. <laughs> and that was very exciting. And I remember it was, so when I was in first grade, a, a song that was very popular was um, The Candy Man, uh, sung oh. by Sa Sammy Davis Jr. Um, the candy man can cause he mixes it with love to make the world taste good. <laughs> and I loved that song in first grade and I wrote um, a book called The Can Man about a man who collects cans and turns them into toys for children. Oh. And I remember this very clearly because the thing that, the reason I remember it is because of the attention I got by that teacher who didn't tell me she was going to show it to someone, but I saw them in the hallway kind of talking mm. about it. And I think that was the first time I felt like, oh, I can get, you know, uh, yeah, I can get this love, mm. right, from people. People can show me that, that, um, that something I do has value. 
Um, but then it wasn't until really fourth grade that I started writing poems that I mm. really, you know, uh, so started you start, reading you and writing with poems. Fiction and then write the poems. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Uh, and I probably had no idea of, of uh, what genre meant, but um, but I was attracted to poetry, and and there was an anthology. Um, that I got, you know, I don't know if I got it out of the library in fourth grade, but I, I just loved the poems so much, and I didn't want to give the book back. Oh. And my fourth grade teacher sent a note home saying that I had this book, that I hadn't returned it, and that I needed to return it. Um, and I, and my mother asked me, did you, you know, do you have this book? And I had hidden the book because I didn't want to return it. And I said, I don't have the, I did return it, right? Um, and so I had lied. I had lied because I wanted this and I wanted this book so badly. Um, and I was, I guess, I don't know if I was willing to face the consequences. Obviously I wasn't facing up to the fact that I had taken it, but it was, it was also that moment of, rec of recognition that I would rather transgress in this way, even though I was always a very good girl and a very good student in school, but this thing meant so much to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I started, I'm sure, imitating what I was reading. And so that was the first moment I think I considered myself a poet. Yeah. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> Fourth grade, can you imagine? Yeah, that's really, that's really cute. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, is your aesthetic statement in the uh, new anthology of the uh, Angels of the America clips, you mentioned uh, several writers and theories that influenced you. Yeah, I'm going to look at it because, yes. <clears throat> as you know, well, the question is, are written a while. Mm -hmm. really, I would like you to tell us if there was like one in specific that inspired you to be, to become a poet yourself or uh, one that affected your writing the most, or one that you relate the most, like in a personal level. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mentioned a lot of writers here. I mean, Frank O'Hara, um, in particular, again, you know, talking about these anecdotes, these kind of formative moments. Um, when I was in high school, it was my first year, I'd, I'd gotten into an argument in the morning with my mother. Now I realize as a, as a parent that all these arguments between parents and children always occur in the morning because everyone's trying to rush out the door. But I got in this argument and I was very, uh, very upset about it. And my brother, who's older than I am, who was already working, um, I think he was working as a, uh, um, like an adver probably an advertising at that time, mm. um, just kind of one of his first jobs. Um, and, uh, he he went to a used bookstore that was close to his job, and he got this book. and He knew he knew very little about poetry, but he liked um, this uh, Frank O'Hara book. It was the the selected, and it had the oh, what was the the cover? The illustrator, I know who it is, hmm. but it was this very distinctive. A lot of people will know if if they this, listen to this what cover I'm talking about. It has sort of this um, naked man on the cover, and um, my brother, who you know thinks like an artist, like a visual artist, really loved the cover, so he chose it based on that, and he just wanted to make me feel better. And I still have that book because it has the inscription of you know, you know, just you know, don't worry about what happened, whatever you <laughs> it's know. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but it was the first because up until that point. I was really, um, I was reading sort of the romantics only because I was really into the Smiths and this, and like Morrissey would so, would talk about Yeats and Keats and all. So I started reading these people because of of this music I was listening to, and Frank O'Hara, his voice felt so contemporary to me. You know, it felt so alive and so there was it was kind of muscular and um, and I thought, oh, you can. You can write like poems don't have to rhyme or something. They can t also talk about going to buy records. They, you know, you can go to the record mm -hmm. shop and and then write a poem about going to the record shop. And you can write poems about meeting with friends and um, and there there was something about that. There was also something very cosmopolitan and urban because you know I grew up in a city. It was very urban. And he was from New York and being from New Jersey, this fantasy of one day living in New York and being a New Yorker and being kind of like a career gal or something just excited me. 
Um, so that was the first kind of sort of entry mm -hmm. into contemporary American poetry. And then there were people who came, you know, uh, probably coincide, you know, around the same time I discovered, you know, um, William Carlos Williams, mm -hmm. um, Lorca was uh, very influential um, early on as well. And then later on, I just discovered, you know, um, a whole bunch of people. And here I'd sort of quote Nathaniel Mackey, who in grad school um, just kind of blew my mind. I just think like his, his musicality and the way that he kind of creates um, this uh, relational identity, like the way that people uh, um, sort of create this lineage um, through elective affinities. Um, I was uh, really interesting to me, and I just think he's such an amazing, you know, sort of poet and scholar. But he helped me to think too of like how how your scholarship and your scholarly writing can also be poetic. Mm. Um, so yeah, so those are just kind of like reminding myself of of what I wrote, um, the the people who have influenced me, right, yeah. Right. And Farid, who's a friend of mine, but that came much later, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, and you have mentioned, uh, you have just said that you, like a lot of it, like, uh, you came from an industrial background, a working mm -hmm. class background, mm -hmm. and that your fa father worked in a dye house and your mother in, in a number of small assembly line jobs. But as a poet and a professor with a PhD in literature, mm -hmm. uh, who also co uh, how do you think your background affects the way you approach the academia um, and writing and even like teaching, you know? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think there can be various answers to that. One, my approach was um, I didn't know what to do. I mean, really, when you when you enter academia, I mean, I, I think it's probably a, a, a foreign country to anybody who enters it. Academia has its own sort of culture or various cultures depending on where you go and certain rules and behaviors um, that you have to learn. But I think that um, some people can become acculturated um, a, more easily or they have they already have sort of like those mentors or family members who can sort of guide them through the process mm -hmm. and to me it was it was um, a real culture shock like mm -hmm. I didn't know how to navigate it and I've had some people help me I was just talking to Roberto Tejada before this and I was telling him like what how important he's been to me in helping me navigate mm -hmm. he's he's and he told me about his mentor so there's this way in which um, I tell my students, and and you know, because they'll come to my office and they'll say, I don't know how to write, um, you know, a, a statement of purpose for my application. How do I do this? And I was like, Who does? You know, <laughs> so it's just like getting rid of the shame for me um, is acknowledging and remembering that I was in that position too, and I was embarrassed to ask because I thought I was supposed to know already. Mm. So for me, it's also about sort of passing on that that mentorship, and I work. Um, at a university, University of Texas El Paso, where I have a lot of students, you know, who are going to college for the first time or going to graduate school for the first time, you know, so, and many of them who come from working class backgrounds, um, children of immigrants, immigrants themselves, or live in Juarez and travel into El Paso to, to take classes. Um, and I, I feel a, um, a kinship with, with um, you know, their struggle to kind of figure out, like, mm. you know, what is available for me? Um, what can I do and how do I get there? Um, so I've uh, tried to encourage my students to seek out things, but also to kind of tell them what the reality is mm -hmm. um, and what they need to do. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think that's part of it. Um, I'm also, uh, I, I think from early on, even when I was doing my MFA, I had very much this mentality that, um, you know, I needed to clock in and clock out. You know, I really, that, that if I wasn't producing something, that I wasn't earning my keep. And I still very much think about that. There's a lot of 
guilt involved with sort of free time or you know and sometimes writing just takes time to cut but for me it's 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 hard to reconcile the 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 kind of you know in some in some ways what looks like leisure the leisure that that is needed for kind of poems to emerge or things to kind of coalesce and make sense um, because I very much think in terms of you sit at your desk you do this you do this you you kind of get things done um, and I think that has a lot to do with kind of you know um, uh, pay, you know this idea of a wage or the mm -hmm. idea of like working by the hour um, and but, ac but academia doesn't work that way because you're answering emails at 11 p.m. You know, when my parents clocked in and clocked out, my parents never talked about work once they right, got right. home. They clocked out. They were done. They clocked back in. They they weren't checking emails at work because they didn't exist. But it wasn't like they, when they were at work, they were at work. And when they were at home, they were at home. And I think for me, you know, it's taken a while to get used to the kind of permeability of mm -hmm. or the lack of boundaries between this right. and that and taking work home <laughs> and then just working all the time and all the time right mm -hmm. but but still you know at the end of the day um, and maybe I'm being Pollyanna po Pollyanna ish about <laughs> it but I feel so grateful mm -hmm. that my I do what I love I mean I don't know if my parents would ever have said that they did what they loved you know mm -hmm. so yeah so, um, so can I ask you to read us uh, two poems, actually? One is the Gogo Launch. Oh, right. Uh, the Sixth Avenue Gogo Launch. Yeah. The Sixth Avenue Gogo -Go Lounge. The Sixth Avenue Gogo -Go Lounge breaks down the language of sentiment and the girl who speaks a fluent you rubs a little sense into your lap. Four bucks later, you think you've made some progress. Subjectivity finally means something. Outside, El Bombero wears a paper-thin nightgown once belonging to his wife and tries to kill Polly with an ax handle can't blame everything on paint fumes, you little fuck. You can't get up for this sort of thing every time. And cut rate like blowjobs behind union dye and frost quick. The Sixth Avenue go-go lounge is not post-industrial, post-colonial, post-modern. It's no sadder than most things. It's not a text to be read. Hey, no European sports, read the sign. Perhaps dancer to drinker ratio suggests the inflated economy of migration or memory, you cheap bastard. Polly, half blind and a smashed thumb, says, I can make you that, but it won't taste like you remember. The Sixth Avenue Go Go Lounge, making no apologies for your future problems. Package goods open Christmas Day. Thank you. And I actually have one more poem, a shorter one. And it's our fear of being forgotten. Yeah. Our fear of being forgotten is the trip to dry land. We watch as the people we know to be dead float calmly on their backs, our boat parting through them. Thank you. You. So um, there are several poems in which you mention, <clears throat> in which you touch the subject of memory. 
mm-hmm. um, our fear of being forgotten and the Sixth Avenue at Google Launch is being only one of them, yeah. some a few of them. Um, do you view your poetry as a sort of like biography or or better say, a, a better question would be how do you think your personal history uh, weaves in with like general history and politics of let's say Latino poetry or even poetry in general? Yeah. Um, well, it's inevitable that it does. I mean, you know, subjectivity or identity, um, it you know never sort of occurs in a vacuum. Um, and so, so yes, uh, it, it does. And the and the way that I sort of explore it, I think, is to see, you know, when when I think back on a certain memory or sort of an anecdote, is I is I try to um, see how does it, uh, what does it reveal mm-hmm. about, um, uh, you know, particular um, that particular historical moment or the relationship to other things. Like how how does it reveal a larger condition? Mm-hmm. Um, beyond my own condition. I'm not interested in just telling an anecdote. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so when I think of something interesting that happened, or I think, oh, that thing about my childhood, I want to say, like, why do I keep coming back to mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. And, and what will it say about sort of the changing condition of the working class, for example, um, or the way, even if it talks about for, you know, the Sixth Avenue Go-Go Lounge, if I grew up next to the Fifth Avenue Go-Go Lounge, and one of the things that I was exploring there is in some ways how we, we you know, create romantic portrayals um, or sort of nostalgic, we, we frame in these nostalgic ways um, our working class past, for example. And there was this kind of, you know, I'm almost writing to my, uh, it's kind of like an angry angry response to myself of Mm -hmm. saying, you can't just turn this into um, this, this thing to be consumed by others who who want to be voyeuristic Mm -hmm. about how some people live. You know, this isn't just something to call, you know, this isn't just, you know, postmodern scene or this isn't just mm-hmm. you know post-colonial or whatever that there's this way in which we kind of reduce this into these categories so I, I, I always want to comment or sort of have have the, enough distance to comment on the effect of using that memory and sort of a recognition mm-hmm. where it's, it's, it's kind of I think a, a, um, for me it's a an ethical um, uh, self-questioning of mm. of why it's ending up in the poem and, and how it's ending up in the poem. Um, and writing allows you to do that. And writing allows you to do yeah, it, because I think that it doesn't really it doesn't always happen immediately, mm. right? Um, and then, for example, and I read last night Paramore, um, you know, which is this this speaker who's having an affair with English, oh, right? I read that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> and and I and for me it's like, oh yeah, of course that's you're saying memory. It's my personal experience, mm-hmm. right? It's my personal experience. I mean, it's not my personal experience of having an unaf- I mean, right? I mean, it's <laughs> like to to say that to say that <coughs> that it's a um, it's a metaphor, mm. you know, maybe is 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 redundant. Of course it's a metaphor, right? Um but the parts of the true, of course, my my parents, yes, they they didn't want us speaking English in the house. So all of that, it was taken from my experience. But what does it it points to a larger experience, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I think that I think the reason that you know so many people have said to me that they like that poem or that that it speaks to them in some way is um, some of us do feel like we don't belong to the English language, right? Um, and uh, and that we don't belong to the Spanish language either. I mean, we're always kind of estranged from both, you know, the, the, the mother tongue and, you know, the, the, the one that for some of us, like me, came very early in life and, and sometimes becomes the dominant tongue even though it's not the mother tongue. So it's it's always pointing to this kind of larger condition because if it stays just as 
uh, an anecdote. Um, it's not interesting to me. And I'm not even talking about universality. Like, I don't think that, for example, Paramore is universal. Um, I don't know how many people think of English as something that is not theirs, that they're just kind of having this fling with. Um, and they're so hoping, you know, we'll leave the other, you know, to sort of be with them. But um, I think it, it, it's, it, I think even if it doesn't speak to their experience, they, they get a sense of how some people mm -hmm. relate to, to two languages. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> also, apart from memory, yeah. much of your poetry also uh, deals with different ethnicities, language, social classes, and genders. And there exists like a poetics of conflict. I felt and of opposing oppos of opposing like positions and sometimes even of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is its place of this poetics of conflict in your identity, or maybe in the reverse? What is the place of identity in the poetics of conflict? Can you tell me like specifically where you see some of these things? The like the conflict. Yeah, yeah. Like, I guess, like, we were talking about Paramore, there's that tension between languages, yeah. but there's also, like, um, in the Google launch, you know, yeah. we see that social class being depicted yeah. in a very different mm -hmm. way. But there's, like, always this, I did feel there's always this tension in, this, in your poetry. Yeah. And sometimes there's reconciliation, and I talk about, like, so again, Paramore, where there is kind of, like, the mother comes around. Yeah. But there are times when, there's not that like it just it it's almost it and uh, it's because the, it's the poems we just read but yeah. they keep coming back to it like the gogo large it just kind of has this denouement this sad fading out where mm -hmm. there's nothing resolved it says like uh, it won't take care it won't do anything for your future problems it won't take any responsibility just yeah. kind of like yeah yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Um, and I like how you pose the question, so where, where is the role of conflict and identity? Where is the role of identity in conflict? In conflict. Is that right? Yes. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think in some ways, um, from the very beginning, I think many of us are conflicted as to our identity, right? Mm -hmm. There's this sort of initial conflict and, and that is posited as loyalty, what are you going to be and who are you going to identify as, right? Are you going to identify um, as, you know, the uh, sort of the same identity as, as, your, as your parents? And then you're bringing home these ideas of Americanness, right? Um, and various strains of Americanness that, that um, put you at odds, right? So I think I felt very much like the formation of my identity mm -hmm. was in conflict constantly, mm -hmm. right? That, that it was, it, um, and that I was constantly kind of shifting, right, to appease. So I was, you know, more American here and, you know, more Spanish there. And I was like trying, you know, um, and I think that, you know, I had to find a place in some way. I mean, I think that's sort of what Latinidad provides for me is kind of a, a, a place where, um, you know, it's not that that conflict is resolved, but it is a way in which, you know, what, what do those two things become? What is, what is then the community that um, I'm a part of mm -hmm. that doesn't have to choose, that, mm -hmm. that can be, that, and by choosing, that conflict isn't resolved. Mm -hmm. The choosing the community is also about allowing the conflict to kind of remain okay. and be and be part of um, a, a constant process of change. Mm. But because I think I think that if if conflict is resolved, then you don't grow, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, it, because you're it's always about kind of re-examining uh, where you are and re-examining why you are and mm. questioning you know your loyalties and if you should have them to mm -hmm. begin with so that comes into the work naturally because mm. it's it's how i think of myself mm. i think of myself as and the class thing too you know um i'm constantly conflicted about you know how different um my life is mm -hmm. um from other people 
Like I, I recognize my privilege. I mean, sometimes when people talk about, you know, um, um, and I complain too. I complain all the time about, th- you know, uh, di- you know the uh, the difficulties I might face. Maybe the the um, funding I'm, I can't get for travel and for my university or things like that. You know, but the the truth of the matter is, I recognize that I'm in a place of privilege. Mm -hmm. Like I have access to privilege in many different ways and I may not make as much as a lawyer, Mm -hmm. but that access to privilege, so many people don't have it. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I write, I mean, I write about, you know, there's a poem in the new book and in um, my other tongue that's going to come out with future poem next year where I have this dream and it's interesting because after I've written, after I wrote the poem, um, you know, sort of a couple of years after I wrote the poem, I can't remember whether I actually had the dream or I just wrote mm-hmm. about a dream that I had invented. So that sort of the line between the, mm-hmm. the fictional and the real is blurred now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I write about this dream where this was during the Occupy Wall Street. Oh. Um, it was during the first few days of Occupy Wall Street. And I have this dream where the the occupy the occupiers, this kind of mob of occupiers, start cha- like protesting me, like they're chanting against me, <laughs> because the whole the whole poem from you know up until that point is talking about um, you know various things. My my mother had first. Be- become you know sick during that time and 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 um so i was sort of dealing with that and i was talking about um the kind of work that she did and i taught and i talk in the poem about when i was a wall street temp which i was for for quite a while and so there's this all there's this kind of um alignment with the occupy movement there's the kind of like i'm with you Mm. But the poem turned surprisingly on me with that dream, which is like, oh, really? Because I think you're the pro, you know, like, you we know, are if against the- you. Yes, exactly. And then I, and, and, but I think that, like, coming to terms with that, that conflict mm. is also like, it's ethical, right? Mm. It's about saying, you know, it's not about, um, you, it, you know, I, I think that I've, you know, earned where I am and, and all of that. But there are a lot of other people who work really, really hard. You know, my parents worked really, really hard. They could have, you know, they, my dad worked himself to death and he couldn't have had what, what I have now. But I think that making, putting that, is uncomfortable as it is for me mm-hmm. to put that on the page, mm-hmm. to put that, that class conflict um, there and to recognize that as much as I can talk about being working class or having been working class, I'm not that now. Mm-hmm. And so I want I want that to I don't want to just romanticize I was working class because mm-hmm. it's also about being middle class that that need you know what it's become and you know what I've become in relation to that past is mm-hmm. also important. Right, right, and certainly. Uh, I feel that your poetry also challenges us as readers to consider to take that conflict on mm-hmm. as well, which mm-hmm. is which is I think it's great. Um, and uh, we were talking slightly about Paramore, so I would actually like you to read it. Sure. It's in page seven, I believe. Oh, great! There we go. Paramore. English is dirty, polyamorous. English wants me. English rides with girls and with boys. English keeps an open tab and never sleeps alone. English is a smooth talker who makes me say, please. It's a bit of role playing and I like a good tease. We have a safe word I keep forgetting. English likes pet names. English has a little secret, a past, another family. 
English is going to leave them for me. I've made English a set of keys. English brings me flowers stolen from a grave. English texts me, slips in as emoticons, goes to all the mixers. English has rules but accepts dates last minute. English makes booty calls. English makes me want it. When I was younger, my parents said, keep that English out of our house. If you leave with that miserable, don't come back. I said, God willing, in the language of the Inquisition. I climbed out my window, but always got caught. English had a hoopty that was the joint. Now my mother goes gaga over our cute babies. Together, English and I wrote my father's obituary. How many times have I said it's over and English just laughs and says, come on, senorita, let's go for Chinese. We always end up in a fancy hotel where we give fake names. And as I lay my head to hear my lover breathe, I dream of Sam Patch plunging into water, a poem English gave me that had been given to another. Thank you. So <clears throat> in a lot of other interviews, and even like previously, we have talked about how you touch on the subject of politics, identity conflict, and all yeah. such. But I also discovered that um, there are poems uh, where love and eroticism is present. It's bird missed the differences in your poetry. Yeah. And for example, Cante Grande with the songs that insist, and migration with the bodies on the bed together that are vigilant of ca casualty. And Paramore, like, where it's a lot very fair with English. Yeah. And so I would just want to ask you if you could tell us more about what place like these subjects of like love um, and eroticism uh, uh, have in your poetry and aesthetics. Yeah. Because it's, it, I just felt that it wasn't really talked about. Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, on the, on the first hand, I think that like our desire, I mean, we talk about our desire for things in this various way. Like our, you know, so our desire for language, it's there's sort of like an erotics of yeah. language. I mean, you know, you know, Barts talks about this in um, the pleasure of the text. I mean, we're just kind of like, you know, it's like we're we, are, you know, our bodies interact with this other body on the page, and this this kind of, you know, sizzling, crackling thing that happens between you know the these two skins. Um, so you know, I I think that erotics is you know that I think about those erotics, but I also think about sort of and, and Roberto you know, um, talks about this too, the kind of, you know, erotics and, and desire, um, you know, uh, between countries too, of kind of desiring the other in this kind of way that um, that's expressed. And I, I read National Affair uh, last night where I also used sort of the trope of the affair um, to, to talk about this way that it's that you know, there, it seems like these countries in conflict, but it also seems it sort of obscures this kind of wanting mm -hmm. as well, this kind of desire for the other that is is also at you know at the the heart of I I think um, uh, a a lot of these negotiations, a kind of history of sort of interaction, right? Um, and uh, you know, which which often takes like sort of has horrible results too, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so 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 there's that. But then on just on a basic level, like I I do especially in this this new book, um, my other tongue. Um, you know, I wrote that book. Um, I started writing that book when I had my daughter, who's now six. I'm a, I'm a very slow writer. It takes me a long time to put a book together. Um, uh, you know, when my, well, actually, probably even before my daughter was born, but it really, I think it took, it, it, uh, the, be the, the poems I kept in it started in 2009. So, um, so it's about mothering 
Um, and there's, so the, the poem is very much about kind of that love, but that, that love is also, you know, when you become a mother, it's also full of fear. Mm. And those fears are, um, you know, who is, who is saying this? I just remembered someone, uh, oh, I, I just read something by um, um, uh, Natalie uh, Center Sapico. Natalie Center Sapico, mm. she's, she's a poet. Um, who was originally from from El Paso, and she was she wrote this beautiful piece somewhere where she was saying that when her mother was uh, pregnant with her, mm -hmm. she was so fearful that her daughter would never learn Spanish, and therefore they would never they, that it would cause this chasm between them that they would never oh. this fissure because she would never learn her mother tongue right because oh. you know she was going to be born mm -hmm. in the United States. And um, and I really related to that because even though, you know, I speak English, I'm with a, my partner doesn't speak Spanish, he speaks English. Mm -hmm. um, this has been a struggle with my daughter from the beginning, you know, um, trying to um, sort of speak to her in Spanish and at her at times rejecting it, even though we're in a very bilingual place, she goes to a bilingual school, so she's learning it. Mm -hmm. But there's this way in which we're negotiating, um, you know, my mother's, like my mother tongue, but what is her mother tongue? Mm. Because is that ne necessarily mine if English is what I speak at home <coughs> to her with my partner? So love is expressed through language but it's also been a it has been a place of conflict mm. between us right. because it cannot be coerced uh, it can't it has to be it can't but love is all often full of conflict mm. and full of these negotiations that produce a lot of anger so you know the the book talks a lot about that and then of course the love you know the the book is about this motherhood you know um uh my motherhood but also my mother mm -hmm. you know who has sort of entered this phase in her life where she's um you know just not well and um and you know what does that mean and i think um for me it's also um m made me return to um, s some of the s sort of themes that I think I've always written about, which is, um, uh, you know, you know, working class women. So I also I often think of like the women who take care of her. They're immigrant mm -hmm. women. So it's also about the love, like how, you know, um, the this conflict of I love her so much, but I'm not taking care mm -hmm. of her. Someone else is on a daily basis. Mm -hmm doing that who's showing her that love at that moment um and so there's you know for me that that love is is never not tinged in some way by um uh politics mm -hmm. um it's never not tinged with these kind of larger questions but yes the 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 lo the love is is definitely there, but you wanted to talk about those the two early poems. I don't know if we can look at them for oh, you know we don't one? have them here. Uh, you were saying Cante Grande and migration. Yeah, because yeah. they're in the wind shifts, right? I don't yes. know if you oh, yeah yeah, yeah I no that's okay yeah. because I just wanted I I I wanted to mention those because those are so different from the things I'm writing now. That mm. was from my thesis, mm. and some of those poems were were published in some journals, but that's from like the mid 90s. And what I was doing there at the time, so my dad had just died. Mm -hmm. And my dad was a big collector of um, Cante Hondo or mm -hmm. flamenco records. And he just, um, and I I got his, um, I sort of inherited that passion from him. And I was always, even from a little girl, would listen to these records with him. And so when he died, I took these records from my mother's house and I started transcribing them, transcribing the lyrics. And I started thinking about um, these, the, um, these kind of themes that would 
that would um, emerge in this kind of negotiate these kind of micro negotiations that that took place, especially sort of gender negotiations um, that I thought were were interesting. So um, yeah, was Cante Grande is I think about my father. You know, I can't even remember these poems. You know, they're so so long ago. But um, the silversmith is because like those jobs, like yeah. silversmithing and stuff, are um, uh, associated with um, the Romani gypsies uh, mm -hmm. of Spain. So the, those jobs are often referenced in the songs, and they're also referenced in Lorca's work because mm -hmm. Lorca was also sort of, um, uh, you know, his his work would draw on folklore and sort of, you know, folk culture. Um, and so I was sort of influenced by Lorca at that time, and I was, you know, creating these kind of allegories using these these songs. And that love for me uh, was in, I think, kind of communicating with my father by listening to right. these records mm -hmm. and then making them into mm -hmm. into these into these poems while I was in graduate school. You were talking about your new book. Can you tell us uh, what what was the name again? It's called so it's um, my other tongue, but the Y is in parentheses. Mm. So the way that I envision it, and I and I the the cover ha is isn't designed yet, but I'd like for the title to reflect sort of the multiple meanings that I see in it. So it's my other tongue, mother tongue other tongue, her tongue, their tongue. Mm. Um, because this is about that, that shift, you know, um, and it, it isn't that they're separate things, but they're overlapping things, mm -hmm. right? That my other tongue is also my mother tongue because English has come to dominate mm. very quickly. Um, I mean, I do all my writing. I teach in Spanish and English mm -hmm. um, and obviously speak in Spanish uh, you know, quite frequently um, because of my teaching and also friendships that I have in, in El Paso and family and when I call my mom. But, but there's this, you know, there's this way in which what, you know, is my mother tongue, um, you know, the, the familiar one? Because I think when we use mother tongue, we often talk, we talk about it in terms of um, the, the, you know, what are, what are the term mother tongue, native tongue, first language, first language um, the you know the you, the the language you you're fluent in mm -hmm. right Most fluent, and yeah. it that's not true I know many people including myself or mother tongue is not your the most no. fluent one right um, or and people talk about it in terms of um, having more access to emotion through mm -hmm. your mother tongue um, but I don't know I feel like I can access a lot of emotions in English too mm -hmm. and and I have real intimacy with English as well um, I've, you know, I feel equally estranged from both in various ways, but in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted, I wanted to explore that, but I also wanted to um, explore that specifically through this kind of, you know, um, this generation that is not going to be here for much longer. I mean, the recognition that 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 my mother has entered the the last phase of her life, but that Ra Raquel, my my six year old, is representing this other thing, and I'm very much in this place where it's I I I through language itself. I I'm not sure what's going to happen mm -hmm. to the Spanish, and that kind of. You know, there's a sadness, there's a real sadness to me about right, it. Right, right. Um, but also there's the, the class thing. So if I'm constantly sort of negotiating these identities, my daughter isn't. Mm. I mean, her, her view of what, you know, whatever, um, whatever stories I may tell her about my childhood are gonna be like, oh, mom, stories. those stories, yeah. right? You grew up next to factories, blah, you know her she's just not going to so i wanted to sort of capture that shift as a way again i think to to also point out kind of inequities 
you know, the kind of inequities that still exist there. It isn't about, it isn't a story of ascension or progress or whatever. I mean, I think this is a condition that kind of repeats itself, but maybe doesn't end up where I did or doesn't end up in this sort of, you know, Raquel sort of inheriting this. Um, so, you know, um, I think I think it's sort of reflecting a kind of the the experience of the immigrant, which isn't reproducible. And I think now the you know the experience uh, of the immigrant is different from perhaps what it was for me in New Jersey. Like I never want to generalize. Mm. So I'm so yeah. So those are some of the things the the book does. That's coming out with Future Poem in. Um, 2016, in fall of 2016. Very excited about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We look forward to it. Um, okay, so thank you so much for Yay. doing this interview. It was with wonderful. Us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun.